Hi, we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rick DeWalt, and I'm a guidance counselor here at Park Vista. Uh, we have Ms. Stair, who's also a guidance counselor, Mr. Green, guidance counselor, Mr. Turner, guidance counselor, and Ms. Lester, guidance counselor. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, this, if you've been to other ones, uh, we're each taking just a little part. Uh, this, this is kind of a unique topic, topic and semi-uncomfortable, actually, because it's, you know, how do you set your kid apart? Because you, you're, you're looking side by side, you know, you're like, what's your kid's GPA? What's your kid's GPA? I hear it. You know, I hear it at Publix, I hear it on the soccer field, I hear it on the softball field. Everyone's jockeying, right? But that, look, you can't even admit it. You're like, oh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Did anyone else shake their head? Uh, I get it, I get it. Uh, you know, we, we want our child to be as unique as possible. You know, if they're cookie cutter, that's, you know, that's what's going to happen. You know, you're going to apply for scholarships. Uh, I always tell my students, you're going to apply for a scholarship. They're going to get 100, you know, essays and 100 resumes and 100 applications, and they're going to interview five. How do you get to be the five on the table versus the 95 in the garbage can? You know, it's, they don't meet you first. They don't interview all 100. So what is it on that, on that that's going to make you stand out? What's going to make it rise to the top? You know, and, and you know, it's not just GPA. It's not just anything. Uh, and, and we put a lot of this, on, honestly, on our Remind program. Sorry if you're on my Remind program. Uh, I'm the one that does it, and I was at 5.15 a.m. the other morning. It woke me up, too, so I was, I was missed it. I was. I was like, what an idiot. No, that was me. Uh, yeah, so I, I did apologize. I don't, I don't learn a.m. p.m., I promise. Uh, one of these days. We're also on Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel uh, for all of our presentations. So if any of your friends, no, you probably don't want to tell them because then they would know and then that would be competition for your kids. So. All right, so you won't do it. Uh, but uh, we also under our guidance tab on Park Vista website. Um, there, there are excellent uh, resources out there. Uh, if, if you want advice on admissions, advice on scholarships, you're, you, there's plenty of people out there. Uh, this one, I, I, I go to this one a lot uh, because it's just, it's just common sense stuff. Uh, you know, they, you have to understand, you have to have test scores, GPA, and rigor in your schedule. That's the minimum you have to have. Okay? So that's, that's not optional. So kids will say, well, is it better to have a bunch of volunteer hours or good grades? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, you can't, there's no trade-off, there's no sliding scale. Like, oh, if you get more volunteer hours, if I do more, then my GPA can slack. No. The, the three big things that they're looking for is it, test scores. And, and you have to think about that. Why test scores? That's one thing that a student here versus a student in Utah has to take. So that's kind of like the, the leveling factor. Uh, you know, there's schools out there that give uh, seven points for an A. And I say that as a school that gives six points for an A and an AP and an A scores. You know, why do they do that? You know, you're inflating the, the HPAs. When you see some of these HPAs, we get some of them from some, you know, a couple of private schools. You know, they're 6.7s. Yeah, I don't know about that. We, you know, we can't do that. Uh, so, you know, the colleges know that. Trust me. They're smart. Uh, they're a college. Uh, and and they, they level that off for you. Uh, but after that, okay, so after the big three, what do you do? Well, what are you going to do outside? Uh, it says colleges care about the character of the people they admit. True, true. You want to you want to have good people at your school. Uh, you know what is it that you're passionate about? What does he do every month, every day, every year? Uh, the quality of activities is more important than the quantity. Okay, quality over quantity. You know we talk about the well-rounded student. The best thing I heard was, we want a well-rounded student with a spike. So it's kind of like a ball with this like, like this spike jutting out of it. Why, why a spike? Well, that's their passion, okay? Yeah, we, we want the grades, we want the test scores, we want the rigor in their schedule, but what, what are they passionate about? And, and we can't answer that because every kid's different. Their spike, everyone's spike is different. Um, but, you know, an activity laundry list, you know, they don't impress. I was, I was in 32 clubs. Great, so you paid 32 joining, you know, you know, fees to join the club. What did you do? You know, well, I joined 32 clubs. 
or I joined a couple clubs, and I was the president of this one, I was the vice president of this one. I, I started my own club. By the way, we can't do that this year. Uh, kids have caught on to starting their own clubs. We have a full list. They, we have our, our activities office said, please tell them they cannot start their own club this year. They can apply for next year to start a club. Uh, but we have kids that have started their own clubs there. Uh, college admission people read applications. Uh, yeah, uh, this is what they're looking for. And when I say college applications, the, the schools read them. You have to understand, there's a difference between a state school and a small private liberal arts college that's reading applications. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But a state school, you know, Florida Gulf Coast is looking at, at three things. GPA and test scores and the rigor and their schedule. And they're going to make a decision based on that. You can have no clubs. Now, I, I sound like you're like, really? But, you know, now we're not talking about scholarships. We're not talking about, you know, more competitive schools. Okay? So, um, you know, what is it that, that makes a difference? Uh, you know, we, we had someone that started to think pink here. Uh, what was that, maybe eight years ago? Six years ago, seven years ago? Uh, they're at Georgetown now. So, you know, I mean, I'm not saying think pink got them to Georgetown, but I'm saying that they're, they're focused on one thing. They took that into college with them. They kept, continued to do fundraisers. Uh, they joined a fraternity. They got the fraternity involved in that. And he's they lost. And he, oh, he's in, I'm sorry, yes. He's at law school at Georgetown. <coughs> yeah, not just at Georgetown. Yeah, he's already graduated with honors and now is, uh, is on a full ride at Georgetown uh, for law. Okay. Was not our valedictorian either. Okay. Very good student, obviously. So, you know, you, you can't. Uh, that, I, one of them says, you know, become an expert about fireflies. Right? But you, but you think, like, that's really dumb. <coughs> well, I'll tell you what, I had one six, seven years ago where he had done research on fruit flies and about extending the life expectancy of humans based on the life expectancy of fruit flies because they have a common gene. And, and he told me about this, and I was like, well, you know, I mean, I've kind of seen a lot of stuff, so, you know, if you can impress me with, you know, what you're doing in the summers, and he was, he was doing research on fruit flies. And he continued that for a couple summers, so that looked really good on him. <laughs> By the way, he went to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, leadership. Leadership's a, a big thing. They want to see, not only are you, you know, a participant, but are you a leader? And, and where, you know, where can you be a leader? Uh, anywhere. You can be a leader anywhere. Uh, you know, do you play on a sports team? Are you the captain? You know, is, are you the go-to guy for the coach? You know, are you co-captain? Did you, you know, did you? Are you the one that, uh, you know, won the state championship? You know, what is it? You know, what, what are your highest level of, of, of I want to say, competence and, and you know, confidence level too? Because you have to be very confident to do things like that. Um, you know, like I said, serve the captain of an athletic team. Progress from a regular member to a leadership role. I joined this club in ninth grade, became very interested in it. Tenth grade, I, I was the historian. You know, what's a historian do? Uh, take pictures and, you know, put them on, the, on a disc or something like that. Uh, maybe put a presentation together. And by my senior year, I was the president. You know, that shows the progression. It shows that you stuck to it, um, you know, for, for as, long as, as long as you did. Uh, you, you started out as a, as a camper, and then you became a, a counselor in training, and then, you know, and then you worked your way into a summer program where, you know, now you're a paid counselor for that program. You know, you've progressed through the ranks. Uh, you know, you've just gone beyond the norm. Uh, you know, you've written a play for your school to perform. I mean, wouldn't that be impressive? You know, the school's performing my play. Now, can all of the kids do that? No. That's not their spike. Um, recognition outside the classroom, not participation trophies. Okay, that's the key there. You know, they played 10 seasons of, of AYSO soccer and they got a, 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 you know, a trophy every single season. For what? You know, right? You know, for what? You know, honestly, did you, is it just a participation? You know, is it, is it a certificate? Just, you know, thank you for participating. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think it's a great thing, but actually I don't. But, uh, you know, but I mean, I like the participation part. I just don't like, I was, I was the guy that, West Point Little League and the girls program, and I fought, fought, fought. I'm like, quit buying kids trophies. You know, they were getting, they started out this big, and then they were this big, and then they were this big, and then they were this big for the t ballers. I'm like, their first, I have one trophy. I have one. And, you know, these kids get one and they're five years old, and then they get another one and they're six, and, you know, they, they play multiple sports. Now they have a trophy room. 
for what? For participating. You know, I don't know that you, you know, you're going to get very far on that. But honors, uh, newspaper accounts, rankings, publications, you know, letters of acknowledgement, thank you, appreciation. Uh, you know, what is it that they're doing that they're earning recognition? Uh, what are the specific qualities the college looks for? You know, competence, effectiveness, high energy level. You know, they want to see that you're interested in them. Like people say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to bother them. They, 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 they need customers. You know that, right? They, they're charging you. So they want to earn your business. So, you know, you, you can't be aggressive. You can't. Um, you know, showing interest in the lives of welfare or others. Uh, you know, we, we, we go to a thing called Pathfinder every year. And uh, uh, Ms. Lester and, and Ms. Turner do that every year. And, and we take and you're going to hear about Pathfinder. Um, I told them I can't go anymore because I feel bad about myself when I leave. Because I hear about these kids and the, their accomplishments. What was a one girl last year been to 10 Doctors Without Borders mission trips? I was like, I walked a dog last night. I, was like, I can't come anymore. I just feel terrible about myself. Uh, obviously, I'm going to go, but I mean, I'm in awe when I sit there. I, I am truly in awe of, of, of what they do. Let progress from freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior, and summers. Using summers wisely. Mr. Uh, Trainee is going to talk about summers, what, what we can do in the summers. But let it, let it start in the freshman year. Does anyone care? about what you did in high school right now. No, right? If you build a resume, are you going to put on there that you were in high school? I was a cheerleader in high school. I was in band in high school. I graduated in the top 5% in high school. You're not going to do that now, right? Because that doesn't matter on an adult resume. On a high school resume, they don't care what you did in elementary school, middle school. They want to know what you did in high school. And when you get into college, they don't care about what you did in high school anymore. Now, that, now you're building a college resume. So that, that resume is, uh, we're going to we have a section on resumes today. That's a fluid document, you know, you're, you're constantly building it. Um, and, and here's a word about yearly schedules. This is a, a little thing that we're, we're facing here at Park Vista. It's kind of a cultural thing. Students like to have periods off. Started with the seniors, moved down to the juniors, now it's into the 10th and 9th grade. Well, I'll take a class online and, uh, okay. So when did less become more? Okay, I mean we're seeing it all the time. You, I have a kid will tell me, I'm going to take sixth and seventh off, and I'm going to take the fifth hour. I'm going to do an online class, and I want to go to. And I said, oh, that was all in one sentence. <laughs> that that's two entirely different thoughts. Do you want to do no classes, or would you like to go to that college? Because you're not going to impress them by leaving here at 11 o'clock every day. It's just how are you going to impress anyone like that? Less is more. If, if that were true, Mr. Trini and I would be, you know, gone at 11, 1130. Yeah. Yeah. Tell Mr. Myers, true. We worked hard today. Yeah. I put in a solid four. Yeah. We're not pressing anyone like that. This is from the Florida State University Admission website. Required courses. So there are the required courses. You know what required means, right? The, the key word there is minimum. Okay. In other words, we're not going to look at it without the required, the minimum courses. But then look at the bottom part. I know it's kind of small, I'm sorry. Uh, the typical student going to Florida State has four and a half credits of English, five and a half credits of math, four and a half credits of natural, uh, natural science, five credits of social studies, three and a half credits of foreign language for 23 academic credits. Not 23 credits, 23 academic credits in those five areas, English, math, science, social studies, and foreign language. Those five areas are academics. The typical freshman at Florida State. Now, if you went to Florida State, this is not a knock. I went to UCF, uh, you know, so, you know, it's a state school, okay? Is it highly competitive to get into Florida State? It's not a highly competitive school. Is it a competitive school? Yes. Is it a highly competitive school? No. Okay? 23 and a half, or 23 academic credits. You only have to have 24 to graduate. But that includes PE and your electives and all those. This is 23 academic credits. Yeah. So when your kid says, I want to take six and seven off, go, no. no. Uh, national merit. Uh, national merit is something you earn through the PSAT in your 11th grade year. Uh, we have roughly 750, 800, I think we have 800 for, uh, juniors this year. We had 270 take the PSAT test. 
That's the one that qualifies for the National Merit Finals. They would much rather take the day off than come in and take the PSAT. That's what it says. That's what it says to me. 270 take it, we have 800 for uh, June. Now, we, not like we don't tell them. The county even offers it to the top 10% from last year. They offer them a free PSAT, and we still can't get them. They'll say, okay, I'll sign up. And then we had how many in the junior room that didn't show up? 20? Because they woke up that morning, or they didn't wake up that morning, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the night before, they were like, oh, my friends aren't gone, I'm not gonna, okay. So then you're just taking yourself out of the National Merit Grant running. Because that's the only time you can earn it. And it's a scholarship program run through the college board. Uh, you know, here's how you qualify. I put that all in there and it'll be there so you know you can see all the qualifications. Basically, you have to have the top scores. You have to be in the top 1%, basically, to get to the end. Semi-finalists, then you become a finalist. I think we have how many semi-finalists this year? Five? Two. Two semi-finalists. We have five, five recognitions and then two moving on to semi-finalist ranks this year, which is good. I mean, there's schools that would love to have one, you know? And then you become a finalist and then you become a scholarship winner. Roughly uh, 7,500 get the $2,500 award, then there's 1,200 that get a lot more. Uh, colleges love to brag about how many National Merit Scholars are at their school. Okay, I didn't go far to, to find this stuff from UCF. UCF bragging about uh, they have I how many, 247 National Merit Finalists on the campus. So if you're a National Merit Finalist and you're applying to these colleges, they're like, hello, how are you? <laughs> We'd love for you to come here so we could add one more to that 247, right? Florida State has a program. Uh, UF has a program. Uh, but down the bottom left is National Merit Scholars as ranked by percentage. This was class of 2011, sorry, but you know, it still holds true. 16.9% of the students at Harvard were National Merit Finals. Now, you don't think that they put that in their advertising? Yes, they did. Absolutely. So that's one, one way to do it. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a special lady to all of us because she used to work with us. Uh, she, she was the IB counselor at, at Atlantic for years. Uh, she came and worked with us for a few years. Uh, and now she's the Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Ohio Wesleyan. Uh, Ohio Wesleyan has about, what, about 1,800 students, 1,900 students. Uh, it's in Ohio, obviously. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very small, like a select liberal arts college. She is one of several uh, uh, admissions officers. They fly all over America, and one of the number one states where they get students, believe it or not, is from California to go to Ohio. Uh, that's not an even trade, by the way. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I went to Ohio, but it's, it's not, not anything you want to brag about. Uh, when, so I asked her. I said, you know, she's a good friend of ours. I said, you know, give, I need a quote. I need something. Right? And she said, first off, she loves a coffee chat idea. Of course she would. Uh, and it's very difficult to answer this question, because I was like, what are you looking for? And she said, you know, and, and this is your typical, she's speaking uh, admission officer ease. Okay? You won't get a straight answer out of an admissions officer, because there are no straight answers. Okay? There is no one type that they're looking for. But like, she, she used to be a reader uh, at Florida. And she would go in and read the essays in Florida. And she would tell us about, you know, how, how she would rank and all that. So, you know, we always had that insight. But now she's there. She said, you know, in Florida, it was a different thing. We're looking at GPA test scores, rigorous test. That's what we're looking for. And then the separator would be, if, if they had a kid on the bubble, they would read their essay. Okay. Uh, now she's representing a small, private, liberal arts university. We read applications very differently. She pours over applications now. By the way, we have two students from Park Vista that went there last year. And not because you know, we pushed them or anything like that. They discovered it and were like, oh, wait, hey, we have a connection, so uh, we can help you out there. Um, you know, they look at GPA test scores because that's an indication of college success. But again, virtually everyone that goes there is qualified to be there, or applies is qualified to be there. Now, what's going to be the separator? Uh, we love to see community service and leadership. These qualities reflect the student and what they would bring to our campus upon enrollment. What are the kids bringing to our campus? See, you're, you're, you're thinking it's a one-way road. It's what the college gives the kids. They want to know what the kids are going to give back to the college. 
Ohio Wesleyan is looking for students who want to explore academic options and probably graduate with a major and two minors or two majors and a minor. Uh, we're looking for students who see a broader picture. Strong academics, but also, let me continue to participate in D3 sports, music, art, theater. You look at that website, you would think you're looking at a school that has 60,000 students and it has 1,800. Everyone's involved in something. They make it a point. Uh, and then she said, you know, this is definitely what oh woo, that's what that, their like, little tagline, they're oh woo. I don't know, I don't get it either, but uh, consider it an application. But it's a great, very, it's, there's a very, like, there's a bunch of little private colleges in Florida that, that are in Ohio that are, that are part of this little, like, like consortium. It's, it's a very cool place. Uh, I had a thing, but you can't sell it. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, the Pathfinder uh, scholarships. And how many are part of it? 18 categories. 18 categories. 18 students and seniors. This is Mrs. Turner, by the way. Good morning. Uh, my part of the presentation, I'm going to go over a very prestigious scholarship program that has existed in Palm Beach and Martin County since about the mid-80s. If you're a product of Palm Beach County schools and graduated in the 80s, you may remember this program, the Pathfinder Scholarship Program, sponsored for the Palm Beach Post, and it is based on 18 categories. There are separate categories. In fact, in your handouts, the blue ones, I wanted to direct your attention, kind of flip over. There you go, where it says categories and criteria. Uh, you have here, actually, if you flip it over again, where it says 2018 Pathfinder, kind of gives a brief description of the whole program. Basically, this is a program every year. It's a year-long, almost a year-long process that we get these students ready. These are students that are nominated in 18 categories, which is going to be on the following page, uh, nominated by committee. And at our school, the way we do it, it is nomination by committee. Students nominate themselves, uh, and also teachers can do recommendations, but any student who's either self-nominated or nominated has to submit a pre-application. And the students then elect or nominate themselves in three different categories. The first one is their first choice. And it, the categories are based on from academic excellence, art, business, communications, there's drama, foreign language, but these are the 18 categories that we nominate students. The whole process is when you review the pre-application, the committee actually, they will then decide which students stand out the most in each respective category. So for instance, the academic excellence, that's usually the student who's in the very top of the class, usually ranked number one or two, who has excelled in all academic areas. If you have someone like, for instance, in drama, that's a student that's actually very involved in the drama program, um, not just in school, but actually has done things, hopefully community drama as well, community theater, um, music, instrumental, vocal, those are performance-based categories. They've done very well in the band program and their performance and also whether it's the, the music vocal in the chorus. But the thing with the scholarship program is that these are students that really stand out. They're not just great academically, but they've done things in these categories that first of all, they're pursuing a career, especially if you're looking at things such as literature, mathematics, business. They're pursuing careers after college in those areas. They're going to study them in college, they're going to go into that, and they have done activities throughout high school, hopefully in relation to those activities. So for instance, uh, computer science. And that's just an example. Hopefully this is a student that has been involved in our computer science class here, has done things outside of school, maybe an in, like a work or a job. They've done activities. Of, history, political science, they may be going into law, history later, but they may have excelled very well in, let's say, a, a Rho Kappa, which is an, an honor society. They've done things that maybe that had leadership positions in those categories. Again, these are the elite students of these categories that the committee reviews all the students and see who's going to be the top one in that category. Once they are selected, 
Then there's an apple. We then, the committee then, invites these students. Um, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal to be a Pathfinder nominee, that you're representing your school in the respective category. Once these students are selected, then we then give them an outline on how to do the application. Then myself and Ms. Lester, we work with them on their applications. It's a portfolio they're putting together. And that portfolio is going to include letters of recommendation. It's going to include a resume and highlighting the activities that pertain to that, acti that, to that category. Their transcript. Uh, they can even put supplemental materials like pictures of their trophies or certificates that they may have earned in those categories. It is a process, it's usually about a six week process. And then we submit those to the post. And then there's an interview process. We get the students ready and prepared for these interviews that are usually in March at Palm Beach Atlantic University, where they're going to be interviewing with a panel of three to five judges who will be asking them questions, anything in relation to their plans and goals after high school. And we always have students who come back and tell us who are former Pathfinders, and they may not have won. Maybe they didn't win at the end of the year, which I'll go over, but they found the experience so valuable to them. First of all, getting a resume ready, going through an interview. It really prepared them for things that maybe a college admissions interview, or a scholarship interview, or even interviews later while they're in college, maybe interviewed for an internship. So we really, we, we spend some time with them before the Palm Beach Atlantic interviews, we do a workshop with them where they're actually doing mock interviews here with faculty and staff. We do it over the course of a couple of days. One as a month, like as a practice, and then we do another day as a dress rehearsal. We give them input. So the whole experience for them really is a truly wonderful experience. And then at the end of the year, in May, there is a wonderful award ceremony at the Kravis Center where all schools attend, parents, friends are invited, it's, it's general admission. All the schools sit together though, the sponsors with their students and administrative staff. And I like to say it's a cross between the Academy Awards and the Super Bowl. Why the Academy Awards? Well, because they, they do an awesome job at the Kravis. It's, it's a beautiful presentation. They actually have this, they show, like the, the day of the interview, they're taking pictures and filming the students and interviewing them. Well, they show a montage of those students from their March interview. And then it's music, lights, the whole thing. And then it's the Super Bowl because we're competing with other schools. And you know, Park Vista being Park Vista, we're very competitive. And we like to we like to win, or at least place. And we've been very fortunate that every year we've had, at least in the past several years, we've had students who have um, won first, second, and third places. So there's three places. And the first place winners. And it'll say it in your description of Pathfinders. The first place, and actually it's on the slide before, um, it lists the award amounts. If a student earns first place, they win, they earn a beautiful Astrolab trophy. And Astrolab is an ancient navigational tool that sailors use to find the stars and be guided by the stars. They, that's the trophy. You can see the picture there. It's, it's a beautiful trophy. And that student wins $4,000. Um, the second place winner wins $3,000, and then the um, third place wins $2,500. So there's three places per category. That's how much money that each student can win if they play. So again, being a nominee is a big deal, but then placing is awesome, and winning first place is just amazing. So those are the different places. And every year for the past several years, we've had, we've had several winners. And it's, it's, it's difficult to compete because, as Mr. DeWalt mentioned, you're sitting in the crowd, and you're here, and again, all our students go through great preparation for the interviews. That we make sure their packets, their portfolios are the best that they could be. So everyone is going in with the intention, we want to win, we think we're going to win. And then when you're sitting there, and then you hear everyone who's winning from different schools, whether in Martin or Palm Beach County, usually our students are not upset about it. If not, they're amazed. They're in awe. Because you're hearing about students that, for instance, one year, um, a student who did community service, uh, he actually went to the Bahamas and taught local fishermen how to fish more efficiently or something. It was, it, was a, it was a really interesting project that he did. Usually community service is a type of project that someone initiated, usually. 
Um, we've heard cases about, yes, about students doing st summer programs in Harvard and Yale, and um, not just for one summer, but for a couple of summers. Uh, students who, um, last year, uh, a student who won first place in sports was in the weightlifting team. Uh, I think it was an Olympic developmental team. And, and she also had a story, okay? She had some type of hardship. So you hear these wonderful, beautiful stories, so you can't help but think, wow, they deserved it. <laughs> so to hear that, and, and again, we all feel bad about ourselves when we're sitting there, as Mr. DeWalt says, but it really is an amazing program. There's a lot of perks to it. Again, just being a nominee is amazing, but earning scholarship money is just the icing on the cake. And we have, and I'm going to highlight a couple of our past winners. Last year, we had a first place winner, and she's actually on the far right here, Miss Tori Moses. She earned the Reach for Excellence. She was first place. We were very proud of her. Her sister actually earned second place the previous year, and I'll actually show you some bios of them. But we want to highlight this young man, who's not only the nicest kid you ever want to meet, but he's really the poster child of getting into an Ivy League school. What everything that you do to get into an Ivy League school, and you're doing it right. Um, in 2016, he was part of this valedictorian. He was also our history political science nominee, and he could have. I remember in the committee meeting, all the staff members that were there wanted them him for science. For he really should have been academic excellence. He could have been math. He could have been so many categories. But the committee decided that he would probably be the most appropriately in the history political science category. If you just kind of going to highlight a few things here, yes, he was. He had 5.32 weighted GPA, rank number one, environmental activist. He combined science with politics. Uh, he conducted research on drinking water toxins and reported his findings to the EPA. He spent three summers working with um, Representative Roy Berman. Um, he founded a green tank.org, a nonpartisan uh, online publication uh, regarding issues pertaining to Palm Beach County's environmental, economic, and sustainable. Uh, um, I can't read the name, but uh, sustainability issues that reaches over 23 countries that people can actually access this this blog. He's gone over national issues, so this is a young man that went beyond just the requirements. He actually took initiatives, initiative certain projects. He started certain things, and he's a pathfinder by all means. He's a pathfinder. Yes, he could have been in different categories, but because his whole issue was public policy, we thought political science history would be the best category, and he won. He won. It was um, and, and well deserved. But he's also attending Yale University. He, if you look at, he has like a two-page, two to three-page resume. The resume, and we couldn't, we couldn't shorten the resume. We probably went against every rule of resume writing with him. But there was just no way to actually condense it because he had done so many things. And he and personality, he's he like I said, he he's a wonderful young man. These are other additional winners we've had in the Pathfinder category. Uh, again, I told you about the young lady who won first place. This is her sister who won second place the year before in the same category. And you can see this is a young lady who has a lot of community service hours, vice president of Special Olympics. She worked as GA representative, yearbook editor. That same year, in 2016, we had a young man who placed in drama. We were really proud because they had never were competing with schools such as Dreyfus and other schools that may have great performing art programs, and we do too, but again, it's very hard when you're competing with other schools that have a full performing art program, and he won fourth place in drama. But not only was he an award recipient of Critics' Choice, he did community theater, he had leadership positions in drama, so those are all important too that could make your resume more attractive when you're competing in a scholarship program such as Pathfinders. And then in 2017, last year, I mentioned Tori Moses, who, again, was very involved in many clubs, honor societies, uh, HOSA also worked. But other students that we had, we had Pedro Villan, who earned second place in foreign language. And some of you may assume it was because, well, probably he speaks Spanish. Well, no, he, he does. 
but he won because he took, he was in French and also learning German. He was and he wanted to be a linguist and follow that path after his career. This was a young man also that came from another country back when he was in ninth grade and knew very little English. In fact, virtually no English, and that was able to go right after his first year of high school over to honors and accelerated classes like ACE and AP. He showed that he was a pathfinder in several ways by really searching and aspiring to as high as he can get as an individual and also to pursue the, his dreams of going to college and so forth. He also volunteered at the Guatemalan Mayan Center. So again, that was a really important community service project he had. And then for sports. Sports, we've been very fortunate to play several times. Recently, last year with Tia Tripodi, second place in the sports category. Sports is very much a scholar athlete category. So it's not just that you're a great athlete, but also that you're very academic. She was ranked in the top 10 in her class. I think she was number seven. Uh, she was captain of the varsity soccer team, honor societies. We had a student several years ago who was our valedictorian. And we, again, the committee took a gamble and thought, you know, academic excellence is a very difficult category to compete with because, again, that's usually the top student. And you hear students from other schools that are with a 5.56 GPA and have done everything and so forth. So with this young man, we took a big gamble, and he was the captain of the wrestling team. And we decided, the committee, even though he wanted academic excellence, to put him in sports. He won. He won first place in sports that year, and that was about several years ago. So again, it's not necessarily when the students apply for Pathfinder, they have dreams of, I want to be in this category or that category, but the committee decides ultimately where they're going to be best placed. So this is just a scholarship program, just to wrap it up, that if you have underclassmen students right now, this is an amazing program. They want to try to, again, stand out somehow, join clubs, organizations, hopefully do things that are pertaining, if this is something that they want to aspire to do their senior year, freshman, sophomore year, hopefully those underclassmen start doing things that are going to go outside, not just being a top academic student, but doing things that will make you competitive for scholarships to pathfinders, but other scholarships as well. They really are not just looking at the grades, GPA, and test scores, they're looking at what have you done, what makes you stand out, what things have you done to take initiative in that pertain to your category. So hopefully some of your students here hopefully will get to know them as Pathfinders their senior year. And now regarding summer programs, I'm going to have here Mr. Tweedy. Hey guys. Um, so we're going to talk about summer programs. There's lots of different ones. Um, we'll talk about, this is just kind of an outline, we're going to talk about categories of summer programs because there's all different types. Uh, what kind of the summer programs look for as far as the criteria or requirements to uh, pursue them. Costs and fees, a lot of them have costs and fees attached to them. Um, we'll get opportunities and examples for each of the categories. Now the, category, the examples I put up here are just one or two in each category. Um, you honestly, there's dozens or hundreds in some categories. On our uh, guidance webpage, we do have a list of the summer programs. The one we have right now is from last year. Most of the summer programs start to open up. Applications for a lot of them haven't opened up yet. They generally start to open up like in uh, December, January, February is kind of when the applications open up. So that will be updated. I usually update it uh, as soon as we get back after winter break. Okay. Um, but you can always look on the current list. A lot of those, uh, most of these summer programs repeat every year. The benefits and also the expectations. What are their limitations? What are the expectations that you can expect to get out of the summer programs, the enrichment, and then just some resources that you can check out. So these are the different categories. I'll talk about them briefly. Pre-college programs. These are generally programs where you go to a university. Some of them are sponsored by the university themselves. Okay, so, so like Harvard has their own summer school program, for example. Um, you know, a uh, school like University of Chicago has their own Emory. So different schools have their own summer programs. Some of them, don't confuse these with other programs that are housed at a college or university but are run by a private company, okay? You'll see that too, where the, um, just like we lease out our auditorium, a college may lease out space, so you have to uh, distinguish between those two, and we'll talk about those in a second. 
The free college programs can be general, where you can study um, a broad scope of different topics, or they can be specific. For example, I want to study pre-medicine, or I want to study visual arts, or architecture, or some specific field, okay? Um, there's experiential programs. These, you think like field trip, okay? Um, these are programs where you might go to a major uh, city, either um, domestically or even abroad. You might, um, go through a certain program, like in uh, politics or government, or it might be medicine or pre-med or pre-law or art or things like that. But it's kind of like a field trip. You're paying a fee and you're going to it and you're gonna, uh, they're going to have guest speakers who are leaders in the field. You're going to look at different kinds of facilities. They're going to intertwine cultural and um, outside events with that. But you're paying a fee usually for those, okay? We have leadership-based programs. Um, these are usually programs that um, the student has to already have some demonstrated leadership in the school or their community. Um, and these are gonna broaden your leadership skills. Um, a lot of these are also government-based. Some of them are business-based. So an example would be like uh, the Bank of America one that we'll talk about. Um, there's intern and research-based programs. These are probably some of the most um, rigorous ones. These would be things like at Scripps, or if you saw before when we talked about um, Bishal, like he did, what was it, Bishal? Mirage. Mirage. I get the team next up. Mirage, when he did research, like at FAU and things like that. Um, so those internship-based ones are like Scripps is a famous one locally. Those are um, a bit more rigorous. And then we'll talk about dual enrollment-based programs. Some of these would be like, um, FAU does the Pine Job H2 of the Go. My uh, daughter actually did that this summer. Great program. There's other ones. There's one at Florida State. Um, Young Scholars program that's really good. And then service or volunteer based programs. We'll talk about those. So these are some of the criteria they look at. Some of them are grade level specific. A lot of times you're going to see they'll say like rising 10th grader or rising 11th grader. That means that's the summer before you go into that grade level. They might have age specifications. They're going to look at your GPA, your academic profile, which is you know how rigorous courses you took, what's your overall um, course schedule like, what we talked about before. Some of them will require test scores, especially the dual enrollment or research-based ones. They might look at your PSATs if you're a younger student, like in 9th or 10th grade, or your SAT or ACT if you're 11th or 12th. Most of them do have an essay or personal statement that you have to write. Sometimes they require a nomination or a recommendation from a guidance counselor or a principal or a teacher. And then um, some of them, like I said, the leadership ones or the volunteer ones, you already have to have some established leadership or community engagement. And then sometimes you have to have demonstrated ability or skills or interests. This is a special, like if you went to a visual arts one or a drama or a theater one or a filmmaking, you know, you'd have to uh, issue or provide a portfolio for them to get into some of those programs, okay? There's costs and fees. Now, um, some of them are very expensive, but we'll talk a little bit about them. So one category for these are merit-based with no cost or nominal cost, okay? This includes a lot of the dual enrollment programs, like I mentioned Pine Job, okay? Um, that's one where you're getting dual enrollment credit. There's two different uh, parts of Pine Job. One is the, in uh, one is the internship one. The other one is the H2O to go. I think the ACO could go for my daughter was like 600 bucks, but that's for, you're basically paying for the dormitory and meals for a week. The dual enrollment itself is free, and so is all the experiences they do, and that's held up at the um, FAU Honors College up in Jupiter, and they do have to live on campus for that week. Um, to give you an idea, when she came back from that, about half the kids who do the program are probably from Palm Beach County, but the other half are kids from other countries and all over the United States, so it's just not a local program, okay? Um, these are the most competitive, so like I said, these include the dual enrolled, the research, the internship. Because there's no cost, these are gonna be the most competitive ones. The next one is merit-based with tuition or fee. These are ones where you still have to demonstrate ability or merit. Um, there's usually partial scholarships or financial aid for these. A lot of times they're gonna be based on financial need. Um, so you might have to provide like your tax returns, things like that. Um, and these are still very competitive. Um, so you still, it's just not like you're paying to go there. You have to still be accepted and they have limited access. 
Then there's merit-based um, for underrepresented populations or first-generation students. These are usually free or very low cost, but they have very strict admission guidelines. So just be aware of that. And then you have fear of tuition based with nomination. These might be things like, um, I'm trying to think of one, uh, national, national Youth Leadership Forums, and they have them in different areas like medicine, government, pre-law. You pay a tuition to go there, you still need to meet certain criteria like a minimum GPA or a counselor recommendation, things like that. And then there's ones that are just fee or tuition based, which are like those field trip ones I mentioned, where you're just paying a fee, and maybe there's not very strict guidelines. Okay. These are some examples. I know they're small, but um, so for the example of the pre-college uh, summer enrichment program that's general, like I said, the Harvard Summer School, and there's also one at Duke for Emory. A lot of the colleges have these. They're located on our website. I have some resources later that list some of the best or most highly rated ones in the country. Um, then there's pre-enrichment ones that are specific. This might be one, like I said, for somebody who wants to study. The one I put up here, I think, was for visual arts um, um, at uh, University of San Francisco, I think, is the one I listed there. And then um, the experiential enrichment programs. This is the one I talked about, like, for the youth leadership um, form. And there's also one called discovery.com. That's pretty good. And those are at, held usually in major metropolitan areas and major universities. Okay, so places like New York, Washington, Boston, Chicago. All right. They do have some in Miami. And then um, the leadership one, for an example, here, um, I put, oh, the Yale Global Scholars. This is probably one of the most competitive ones you can do. Um, the Yale Global Scholars is an international one for leadership. They only accept about 250 students, and that's worldwide. It's a very prestigious one. Um, but it's probably a very good example of what a leadership program looks like. Um, it's probably the best for that one. I should have printed this bigger. Internships and research based ones. So I put the Bank of America one here, which is great. This is one where you, when you actually apply, instead of paying something, they pay you. So you actually earn money. And um, you usually do it with a local business in your area, and then you go to Washington for a week, and you go to the national seminar there. And like I said, they, it includes all your costs and everything. You do have to pay some travel expenses up there, but um, they're actually paying you. You're getting a paid internship for this one. Another um, internship one, like I mentioned, that's very popular down here is the Scripps one, Scripps Research. Okay. Um, and then the service volunteer one here, there's a, a website called Volunteens, and I put the other one here, Volunteer Forever. Instead of putting, these are not specific programs, but these are search um, websites where they list a bunch of the different service programs that are good. Um, the Volunteers one is a local Palm Beach County one, so it's places here in Palm Beach County. An example might be like doing it at the Sea Turtle Rescue Place up in Juneau Beach, volunteering there. And they have like summer internships and programs like that, especially if the student was interested in like marine science or marine biology. Okay. We'll talk about the benefits. So the main reason you want to do um, summer programs in enrichment is one thing, it gives you an uh, opportunity to experience campus life. Like I said, my own daughter went to FAU Honors College, teaches them how to live with other people, work in a dorm, you explore college club, she took a college level course, um, she explored a college environment. Um, so those are all benefits especially to do it in kind of a summer program where they're kind of sheltered because with other high school students and expectations are that they're in a learning process. Um, you might earn college credit, okay? So a lot of these programs, even like the one I mentioned like at Yale or Harvard, you can earn college credit and when you go on to college, that credit may transfer with you as a college credit. Now keep in mind that just because you earn college credit, the district does not allow you to bring that college credit back here unless it's an approved dual enrollment program in Florida. The reason they do that is because some of these programs, because you have to pay for them, not every student has an equal opportunity. Our dual enrollment programs are merit-based and funded through Florida, so those you can use. Examples would be like the Pine Job one I mentioned, or the Florida State um, Young Scholars Program. Those credits, because they're through uh, approved Florida dual enrollment, they will come back and go into your Park Vista GPA transcript. 
You have an opportunity to meet new people, explore different places, develop new skills, experience. These are things you can list on your resume, okay? Um, and then, of course, you can uh, explore different kinds of programs and majors. Some of the ones that are more generic um, college experiences, they, you can take different courses in different subject areas. Like you might take a course in architecture and then another course in mathematics or an uh, introductory course in actuary science, things that you might be interested in but you're not sure about, so you can explore those. You might have fun, of course, while encountering new experiences with new people. Okay? There are some expectations. Expect that some of these do have financial um, requirements attached to it. Some are very expensive. They may have um, financial scholarships or assistance, but sometimes the uh, scholarships are partial scholarships, so you're still going to be responsible for some payment. So, and usually if they have financial scholarships, they are need-based, so you're going to have to provide um, financial information, okay? Some of the programs are low or no cost, but they're going to be the most competitive ones, like I said, and some of those you have to meet other criteria, especially if it's like for an underrepresented population or first time in college or first generation college student, things like that. Um, remember again, credits might be awarded, you might earn college credits, but they can only come back to Park Vista if they're dual enrollment based programs, okay? Um, and of course, the programs help um, you develop your skill set, enhance you as a student. You can uh, talk about experiences that um, you encounter on your resume. These become valuable maybe later on when you write your college admission essay. So these are things you can reflect back on, okay? All that being said, just because you go to a pre-college program or a summer enrichment program doesn't mean that a college might or might not consider that, okay? A lot of the ones that they're going to consider are going to be the ones that are more internship-based, research-based, maybe the dual enrollment-based ones, things like that, um, Global Scholars, one at Yale, things like that. If it's one where you're just simply paying like the field trip ones, those may have little impact on your college admission because they're not a merit-based program. So you have to kind of discern that carefully as you evaluate what you want your child to experience. It's not to say that those programs are bad, they provide an experience, but it's, I always tell kids, think of it as like a paid field trip. Some of them are like that. Other ones are more competitive and more, um, you know, will be considered uh, more by a college than others. So you have to kind of, like I said, discern that um, carefully. These are some resources. Um, the first one is just our website where we list the summer programs. I like this website. I send it to Ms. Turner all the time. It has scholarships on it. It's called College Express. So it, it's a um, kind of a global um, college thing, but they do have a whole section on summer programs, and they will list summer programs by category for you and give you some of the ones that are most highly um, rated. Um, it's also a great website for scholarships if your kids are interested. FastWeb, which is also a scholarship uh, search engine, has um, summer programs on it. And then the other two are College uh, Choice and, uh, and the Prep Scholar. Those are both good as well. Um, one other thing is there's a website I've been listed here called In Like Me, and they list some scholar programs too. Okay? Next, I think, up is Ms. Lester. She's going to talk about writing college essays. <laughs> And I talk with my hands, so you may only be able to hear half of the ones that um, Top 10 tips for writing a college essay. Of course, um, these are not the only tips for writing a college essay. Uh, you can go on the internet without running into top 10 this, top 5 this, but these are uh, from the National Association of College Admissions Counseling. And we think it's pretty comprehensive and it, it covers most of the things that you hear from college admissions officers. So we, so we do use these uh, frequently and we give them to students in the senior packet. Uh, every year. Number one tip, start early. More time equals less stress. That seems obvious, but you know, sometimes when you have a series of tasks to do, it's really tempting to put off the one that you think is going to be the most difficult. And uh, in a process like filling out college applications, where it's largely ticking boxes and filling in lists of courses, writing an essay may seem like a really daunting and difficult task. But what you need to do is to reframe that and tell the students. Think of this as 
you know, after ticking all those boxes and filling in courses, this is your chance to express yourself, to be creative, to really let the real you shine through. So think of it as an opportunity, not a chore. And give yourself time so that um, you can do your best on it and not be overly stressed. Number two leads us to be yourself. Um, students sometimes get caught up in, oh, what do I think the college admissions officers want to hear? Or what's a really hot topic right now? Or what great dramatic tragedy you know, do I have in my life that, that can impress the judges? And uh, Really, it's about showing yourself, not trying to second guess what they want to hear. Maybe you don't have a great tragedy in your life, but maybe you're hilarious. Maybe you're a good writer who has a witty way with a turn of phrase. And, and you might go in the direction of you know, a series of ridiculous mishaps that led to a great learning lesson or something that really impacted you. So you have to be you. Um, in a video from the Khan Academy with college admissions officers, an officer from Harvard said, students get caught up in thinking the essay has to encompass your entire life and be groundbreaking and of publishable quality. And that's a lot to ask of a high school kid. They say you should stick to the simple things that you know, and some of the most memorable essays that stand out most in my mind are about simple, everyday topics. An admissions officer from Brown said, I've seen wonderful essays about things like walking the dog or riding the school bus. We're trying to get to know the students through the essay, and those are things that make a great essay, things that tell us about you. Number three, be honest. Plagiarism is a no-no. Never risk your college career by copying an essay from a friend, or from the internet, or from something you bought on the dark web. Admissions officers have read hundreds, sometimes thousands of essays, and they're quick to pick up on plagiarism, on things you copy from someone else, on something that's not authentic to you. And uh, besides, remember, the purpose is to show who you are. Number four, stay focused. Read the essay question carefully and stick to that topic. Remember the advice from the Harvard um, officer, the essay isn't about a list of your accomplishments. Think about the theme and then use that theme to tell something about your life and about what you're about. And you're not writing about what you did or what happened to you. You're writing about the effect of what happened to you and how it impacted you and how it changed you as a person. And while we're on the topic of topics, Renee Buchanan is the communications manager for enrollment management at the University of Florida. She has a blog, and in one of her entries, she listed some overused topics that essay readers have seen many, many times, she says. So if you're asked to tell something about yourself, something that impacted you in your essay, don't tell it in the framework of one of these overused topics. Winning or losing the big game, loss of a friendship or a relationship, critiques of others, classmates, parents, teachers, pet deaths, those are sad, but um, sometimes maybe an overused category and, and not something you want to share in your essay, and anything about my summer vacation. Anybody can write about these generic topics. Remember, we're beating the same drum. You want to talk about you. Number five, put your best foot forward. You know, today's students live in a digital world, and um, they're writing all the time. When we were their age, you know, we largely communicated verbally, face to face, uh, but they spend a lot of time online, and they're writing, and um, for them, internet slang is the language that they use to communicate with each other. When we sat down to write something, it was, a little different. We thought, oh, okay, now we're writing. And you have that mental shift where you sort of formal things up a little bit. Students nowadays are writing so much that when they sit down to write something, especially when the college essay is on the internet, they may approach it like an email. They may not have that unconscious shift. So you just want to encourage them to be aware when you're writing the essay. It's not an email, it's not a text message, no OMGs and LOLs and uh, that, that sort of thing because uh, you don't want to TV and T, thanks, but no thanks. Um, you want to make sure that while they're not expecting you to write a master's thesis in grammar, you know, they expect it to be correct, but you know, don't overstress trying to make it perfect. But at the same time, you know, don't be too informal. You do want to write a nice essay. Number six, write and rewrite. 
Don't try to knock out a masterpiece on the first try. You just never want to rewrite something. Oh, this is a chore. I've done it. It's done. Whatever. Let it go. Uh, uh, see tip number one. Start early so that you have time to write and to rewrite. Stephen King, who's one of the most successful writers of our time, in his book on writing, A Memoir on the Craft, gives a little description of his process. He writes a first draft, and then he says he puts it away. He walks away for a little while. Remember, if you start early, you have time for this. Walk away, kind of let it ruminate in your mind. Come back to it at a later time. Think about your theme and reread it. Does this fit in with the theme? Is this extraneous information I don't need? Is this a little unclear? And do your second draft based on that rereading. And then third, he has some trusted readers, some people he knows who are good editors, who are good at English, some people who know him and you know, know what sounds appropriate for him. And he lets the readers read through it and then gets feedback from them, and he considers that feedback. Which leads us to number seven, get a second opinion, or a third opinion, or more. You want to choose someone to read your essay who's good at English, who's good at words, maybe your English teacher or a family friend that works at the newspaper. You also want someone to read it who knows you, someone who knows if it sounds like your voice, if they recognize you in the essay. Because remember, that's the purpose, to get to know you. Um, in the video I mentioned before, there was an admissions officer from Georgetown who said, ideally, if a student were to drop his essay on the floor of his high school and someone else were to pick it up and it didn't have his name on it, would they say, oh, I know who this belongs to because it speaks to his voice, it sounds like his opinions, you recognize yourself or himself in the writing. Number eight, keep an open mind to the feedback from your readers. We know criticism can be tough to hear, it's tough to ask for, but ask for it and then consider it. Uh, don't feel bad about criticism. Don't take it to heart and think, oh, they criticized it, it's not perfect, and, and let that affect you. No, think of it as, uh, um, as what it is. It's a helping hand from someone who cares about you, cares enough to take the time to read your essay and give you feedback, and it's about the goal of making the essay better. Stephen King, in the, the quote I mentioned earlier, reference, when he gets feedback from his readers, he always considers it. He doesn't 100% of the time you know, take their suggestions, but he considers it, and especially if you get the same feedback from two or three of your readers, then you know where there's smoke, there's fire. If they say that paragraph's too long, it's probably too long. Number nine, proofread, proofread, proofread. True story, when I typed this up, um, I spelled proofread with one O and two Fs. I'm not making that up, I really did. It's ridiculous. Of course, I know how to spell proofread, but sometimes the fingers have a mind of their own when you're typing, so it's really crucial to proofread because you don't want to come off looking like someone who doesn't know how to spell the word. Um, there are, in the packet, there's a list of different methods to proofreading. You can read it really slowly, word by word. You can read your essay backward, word by word, to look for spelling errors. You can read it aloud and listen to it. You can have someone else read it aloud, and you can listen to it. But um, go over it several times. Make sure you proofread to avoid having any errors that are going to be a negative for you. And number 10, <coughs> number 10, don't expect too much. It's an essay. It's not a get into college free card. <coughs> don't overburden your essay with the expectation that this one piece of writing alone is what's going to get you into your dream school. Can it help? Absolutely. Can it let the college admissions officers know who you are beyond your statistics, beyond your numbers? Yes, definitely. But it's one piece of the complete package that, you know, like we keep saying, it's the GPA, it's the rigor of the coursework, it's your correct extracurriculars. But this piece, the essay, should be the piece that puts a face to all that data, a face to the numbers. So use your words and show them who you are. And some more resources here. Um, the list comes from the NACAP, the uh, College Admissions Counselor's website. A couple of books there, Col Conquering the College Admissions Essay in 10 Steps. It's a little older, but it's, it's tried and true. College Essay Essentials. Uh, Ethan Sawyer is the College Essay guy, so you can trademark there. He has his own website. It is chock full of videos, articles, resources. Free stuff, you have a whole section called free stuff. Tips, two minute exercises to improve your writing. Really great uh, resource. The College Board has a section called Big Future where they have articles, videos, 
sample essays that you can read through and critique. And the Khan Academy, among having a million other things, has an entire college section. And next is Megan Stair with uh, resumes. All right, so I'm going to um, kind of wrap it up here at the end, talking about actually putting together your resume. Um, so the resume, of course, now you've done all these amazing things that we've been talking about, and now the resume is kind of that PR thing where you're organizing it. Um, Remember that the ultimate goal of a resume is uh, that you have a user-friendly brief document that someone can look at and get a picture of you, um, usually on one page. Now, a high school resume is going to be a little bit different than you know the resumes that you and I put together for you know job purposes, um, but it's still kind of that same concept, right? You're you're briefly putting into one uh, one document all of the things that you've done. Typically, um, colleges aren't going to ask you to upload your resume specifically, but as you fill out a college application, all of the sections of the resume are on there. So it's really helpful for our seniors, and we tell them that all the time. When you sit down to fill out your application, have your resume right next to you, because all that information is just going to get plugged right into that, that application. Now, when it comes to applying for scholarships, like for example, Ms. Turner talked about the Pathfinder Scholarship, one of the parts of that application is the resume. And there are a lot of scholarships out there that would ask for your resume, so you'll want a formal one for that. Um, you're also going to use your resume for uh, recommendations. It's really important anytime a student asks someone to write a recommendation for them, that they have a resume available. So, for example, when I write my counselor recommendations, I know so much about my students as far as their academics and what we've been talking about with their goals, but I don't know what kinds of things they've been doing at church, outside, or through community organizations. When they provide me with that, recommend, or with that uh, resume, I can include all of that in uh, my recommendation. It's the same with teachers, right? So you go to your English teacher and ask them to write a teacher recommendation, they've got a solid view of you as an English student, they don't know all those other parts about you. So that resume is really super important. Um, some of the other things that, you'll, uh, that a student might use their resume for is applying for those summer internships and that sort of thing. It's also helpful for them to get a visual of what you know, their high school career has been like. Um, so in, you, know, you have the, the list. These are just some possible suggestions of um, you know, sections. The, um, one of the key differences between a high school resume versus like maybe a job resume you know, that you and I would do now, some students aren't going to have all of these sections, and that's, that's perfectly fine. You are including the sections that are, the, that are um, most appropriate to your situation. So here are some suggestions, some do's for resumes. You should start early keeping track of, of, of what you've been doing. In your blue um, handouts, we have this, it's just a, a, a possible way that you could be keeping track of the things um, that your students have been doing throughout high school. By the time you get to the senior year, sometimes it's hard to remember all of the specifics of keeping track. We suggest that you have a file. And throughout high school, just keep putting things in that file that they can go back to. When you call our office senior year and say, can you tell me what awards my child won in ninth grade? Truthfully, we can't. We just don't, that's not the kind of thing that we at the high school keep track of. So you really should be doing it at home. Certainly no later than sophomore year, you want to start having your kid have some sort of formal way that they're keeping track of all of the things that they've been doing. When you're actually writing the resume, you want to be, um, you want to use lots of action words, the things that they've been doing throughout high school. In brief statements, you're not writing an essay with your resume, it's brief statements but um, specific, and, and again, using those action words. And again, in your file, in your um, handouts, we have a, a sheet of all of these different action words that they might, uh, they might use. So rather than saying, I'm good at computers, you say, I'm certified in Microsoft Office Suite. It's very specific, and again, that action, I'm certified. Um, when it comes to your application, or when it comes to your resume for high school, you really can arrange the sections based on the things that, that highlight what's most important to you. So if you are really into community service, then the community service section goes first. If you're a student athlete, then the athletic section and all the, the sports that you've been a part of would go first. You can kind of organize it that way. Again, remember your ultimate goal. 
you are trying to make it really user friendly and give um, a brief, quick picture of what makes you unique, what makes you stand out. Reverse chronological order is typical. So that's that's what most resumes are going to, how they're going to be formatted. That being said, with the high school resume, there is a little leeway if that doesn't exactly work, if, if um, there are certain things that, that your child's been involved in that maybe are out of chronological order and you put it in importance, that's fine when it comes to, um, to high school. You do on your resume, you want to make sure that you include um, the, the number of hours per week or the number of weeks per year that a student's been involved. This gives the person reading the resume a quick view of what, how important each activity was. So here's just some examples. So you're in the band and you're a park district performer, you were there from 9th through 12th grade, and you spend about 20 hours a week. What our park district performers do is a lot different than what other high school bands do, right? Somebody looking at your resume isn't going to know that if you don't tell them that. <clears throat> um, a summer camp counselor. I did 40 hours a week for eight weeks over the summer. Again, giving, giving somebody a quick picture of, of what that activity meant to you. <clears throat> um, just like your, your essay, being honest and accurate is really important in a resume. College applications and scholarships and all that are so competitive. And our kids don't mean to, but sometimes you overinflate what you're doing. Um, so you want to make sure that, that you don't do that. Be very specific and honest and accurate. Your formatting is really important. You want to make it super easy to read. So we have some suggestions for that. And I'm running really quickly. I know we're running late. Some things not to do. You don't want to restate your transcript. Anybody who wants to know your specific um, class schedule, is going to ask for a copy of your transcript, so you don't need to list every class you've taken. Don't include middle school. Um, the only exception to that would be if you've been in something since middle school and you're still doing it, but your awards and activities in middle school are not what they're going to be looking for on that resume. Don't use abbreviations. Write out National Honor Society. Write those things out because they mean different things at, at, at different high schools. Uh, don't waste space. <clears throat> A couple of things you don't need to include on your resume. Um, awards that you've won that aren't real awards. <laughs> so like those participation trophies, you know, who's who among American high school students, you know, they call those um, vanity publications, the things where, you know, somebody mailed you a postcard and said, we'd like to give you this award. Don't put those on your resume. Everybody knows what those things are. And don't include a lot of things that, um, you know, a lot of details that are unessential. Like, for example, the homecoming dance that you participated in in ninth grade. Don't waste space on that. Focus on the things that are most important to you. We have a couple of samples that we put in here. Um, <clears throat> again, typically, your resume should be about a page, maybe two pages. This is a perfect example of a really involved kid. Community service, um, they were in the academy, their extracurricular activities, honors and awards. Um, and again, brief statements, lots of action. You'll see after each thing, they wrote what grades they did, what grades they were in. I know it's tough to see on here. <clears throat> um, this is a, a much longer resume. We only included it just so that you could see. This was one that um, where they had a lot of different um, topics that they wanted to uh, show, for example, like public speaking and research. Remember, with the high school resume, you can include um, the, the sections that are most important to you, and they might not be exactly the samples. If you look in your packet, you will see um, a, a sample resume that you might use. Um, but again, it, it's going to be tailored to what best highlights your student. So um, our next coffee talk is going to be on January 18th at 8 a.m. when we're going to talk about the registration process. Um, <laughs> and I think, does anybody have anything to add? Do we have any questions before we wrap up? Yeah, any questions that you have? <laughs> my, my daughter's good in math and science, and she's an AIDS program. The frustration I have is computer science classes offered here. There's limited some to none. Supposedly, I was told by the counselor that she could take something her senior year. As we all know that right. that's a little bit too late when right. you make an application. Summer programs will be perfect for that. As soon as you can find us a programmer that's willing to work for 40000 a year, we will take them. 
as a teacher. As what's, a teacher. What's my <laughs> option? FAU or FAU, Palm Beach State, but but the summer yeah, programs, can... MIT. So you could do could, dual... could she get in the MIT program without any computer science class? Good question. That's the you know, problem. Palm Beach State for dual enrollment has introductory uh, computer courses. I know they do, but yeah, you know, it, the, the problem runs again. There's no available evening classes. Mm -hmm. Right. Can Summers I, might be the best option. Can I go to another school? Is there another school that I would pay personally for these classes? Would that help? Well, there's, there is AP Computer Science at LBS. There's where? What? Florida Virtual School. They do have AP oh, Computer yeah. Science and Programming 1 and 2 <sighs> on FLBS. Yeah. Now, we teach an AP Computer Science course here. But we're just building it up now. But we're just starting. Right. We only have one teacher. Right. But there is programming one and two on FLBS if, she, if a student wants to pursue that. And then, you know, once they take the programming one and two, they'd be in a good position to take the AP computer science course. But that would be senior year. Or well, junior. not necessarily. You could do it's when they're ready for it. You could do FLB. The FLBS courses are self-paced, so programming one or two you could finish in a few months. So well, that's an FL what? Florida Virtual School. They could talk to their counselor about it. Yeah. But there is a programming one and two class on there. They're introductory programming courses. But then once you do that, then you're in a position to take the AP Computer Science course. Okay. What are the does it help to visit these campuses? We've already visited Stanford, and we were going to visit. Oh, absolutely. Like, but I mean, do they get you? I mean, we're University of Chicago on record. They're mailing the stuff. We went to that one program done at Atlantic or whatever. Mm -hmm. So does that gel in their heads that they're on your well, I mean, visual. Yeah, I mean, visiting the college is more for the student than for the college. Gotcha. Yeah, it's oh, more for the a student. summer program there. A yeah. summer program. Yeah. yeah, University of Chicago has a lot of great summer programs. They actually do. Um, unfortunately, the, if you're not a Chicago resident, if you're actually for Chicago residents, some of them are no cost. But if you're outside of Chicago, they're expensive, but they're good programs. They have a lot of good summer programs at. And speaking of University of Chicago, when we talk about essays, when they were here last time, the guy was telling me one of their essay prompts was right about Wednesday. That's, so that's an essay prompt. And the best essay he read was about a student who wrote about um, the Adams family. So that's the kind of thing they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you.